Can you see those okay? Yep. Great. Um, so I want to start by thanking the group for inviting me to speak today about uh, what we're doing currently in entrepreneurship here. Uh, and for your, somebody's, you're gone. Um, and for the support of, of Surgical Innovations in my new global online class uh, with a few of my students here today. So I think um, many of you are familiar with Innovation Ventures. A number of my colleagues from the group are also on this, the Zoom. Um, we are an outward facing group at UCSF. So that means that we, um, we coordinate with the outside world. We speak to um, pharmaceutical companies that want to partner. We have the tech transfer group. Uh, we have the wonderful Catalyst Fund uh, which is represented here by three people that helps our inventors um, translate their science to the commercial world. So um, anyway, glad to be here. So I'm talking about a company, starting a company. And the question is, why would you want to do this? And here's an example of reasons that people start companies. I don't know how many of you saw the film in 2010 about uh, John Crowley and his children with Pompeii disease. Um, John is a Harvard MBA and pretty much when he was graduating, I think at his graduation ceremony, when his youngest child who was an infant started flopping. And um, you know, months later they discovered it was this rare orphan disease called Pompeii disease. And um, John decided he was gonna figure out a way to do something about this. He went to work for Bristol Myers Squibb uh, he searched for researchers in the Pompeii field. He eventually found some. They weren't coordinating their research. He then found one person that he felt he could work with who had interesting research and he started a company. And the company was to save his kids' lives. And he did. And so these kids were only supposed to live until they were five years old. They're now in grad school. And it's all because of what he did as a passionate father who had technical skills that he could build a company around. He made it happen. And it's, um, you know, we, we all know people who are passionate about the medical field they're working in because of family members or um, something that's happened to them. So that's a great motivator. Um, here's Elon Musk, a different motivation, just that he wants to change the world. And we all do too, because we're in healthcare and we have the opportunity to do that. He's done it in a different way, but it's the idea of having impact and scale. And that's something that um, entrepreneurs that I know are all interested in. They want to make a difference in human healthcare. So you have to have passion to start a company and you have to be passionate about the thing you're working on because it's many, many hours of work, many ups and downs. And if you don't have passion, you will give up and it won't happen. So the question is that many of you may be facing is, can my idea become a company? I've got an idea. I think I know what product it could be. Is this enough to be a company? And so let's contrast for a minute, academia versus industry. You know, very different time scales. In academia, it's pretty relaxed. I mean, everybody's working to the next grant, we know that. But it's really a chance to explore basic science, to go where the science leads you, um, no pressure to have an experiment completed at a particular point in time. Whereas in industry, it's the opposite. Um, it has to move fast, you can lose your competitive advantage if you mess around too much. Um, it's very practical, it looks at clinical applications, impacts on patients, and you have investors, and investors want to see results, and they're not willing to wait. They want you to get to the next proof of concept so you can go raise more money and then and, and do it at a, um, an in, in, inception point. So time skills very different. The research is different. Um, it's a lot more rigorous out there in industry. It's very focused, it's very pointed. Um, it has to be at a very high quality. And many investors, um, or I guess I should say pharmaceutical companies, when we do deals with them, 
they say, yes, I know you've got all this research, but frankly, we're gonna throw it out and just do it the way we need to do it internally. So our standards for research, while we're a top academic institution, it's just different than industry. Third is the culture. So the culture at a university, well, you're, most of you are living it, um, you know what it's like. It's, um, you're there to learn. It's, um, it's there for the pursuit of knowledge. And it's very different than the culture in a company where you're there to get to a goal and do it effectively and without blowing through all your funding. So very different cultural um, situations. Then you have to deal with something called money. Like, how are you going to make it? And again, this is, you know, those of you who are running labs, you know you have to get grants, but that's, that's very different than having to figure out how you're going to make money out of this product, this company that you're creating, and, and how you're going to get people to give you more money based on how you're going to make it. So you have to come up with your business model, and you have to figure out who's going to pay, and these are very different considerations than being in academe. Then you have to communicate. You have to be a really great communicator to be able to pitch not just investors, although that's of course key, but employees, uh, potential employees, uh, people in your ecosystem. You have to go out and keep telling your story and do it in a persuasive way, a passionate way. And, and, a, and be able to communicate not just the depths of the science, but really what the benefits are. So you have to craft a message and that, will, that ties to your mission and vision. What is your mission in the company? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to cure cancer? Are you trying to help um, cancer patients who've been left behind because you're salvage patients? What's your vision? Where do you, are you going to take that? You have to be able to think big to attract people to your idea. And last, selling. And that's pretty much what we've just talked about. It's selling all the time. It's selling to investors again and again and again, and to partners, to um, device companies, to pharmaceutical companies, to whoever. Ever. And it's not a one-time deal. You have to keep going back. You have to tell the story. People have to get comfortable with you and the story. So again, it's just a very different setup than academe, and it's definitely not for everyone. Sorry, I'm gonna pull this, I'm to pull this, so it's not for me. Let me just have to let it rain, sorry. Um, okay, so now that you know what's involved in the culture, if you're still interested in starting a company, um, Think about how you're going to validate your idea. You've got an idea. You're a scientist or, and you know that it's something that you need or that people should need or patients need or whatever, but that's not enough. You have to validate it in the outside world. And the outside world is not UCSF, by the way. It's all over the country. Um, it's institutions that are not top tier academic institutions. It's with people who are gonna pay the insurers and so on. So how do you do that? Well, first you do some research, desk research, and then you come up with a hypothesis. Um, just like the scientific method, you, you take that hypothesis out in science, you test it by doing an experiment, and then you come back, you analyze the results from the experiment, and then report whether your hypothesis was correct or not. We do something called customer discovery, and that's applying the scientific method to developing a business model. It's the same idea. You observe something, you come up with an idea, you have a hypothesis, you test it by experiments. The experiments are not in a lab, however. Uh, they're with payers, they're with users, they're providers, um, they're with pharmaceutical companies. Then you try to validate those results and maybe you modify the hypothesis if you're not getting traction on it and then go try again. Same kind of process. You have to figure out what value you're going to deliver to the customer and that's called the value mm -hmm. proposition. And I just wrote a couple of examples here. Um, here's one, an app that improves communication between the patient and care team reducing adverse events 20% during an average hospital stay. 
this doesn't tell you what the tech behind the app is. It tells you what it does, what the benefit is. And here's another one, um, reduce A1C with this method of, of beta cells. So you have to figure out what is it that your tech is going to do that the customer might want and then test that hypothesis. And what you do is you, until you get traction, you're hearing from customers, many customers, um, yeah, I've got to have this, that's amazing. It's just what's been missing in my daily life, in my whatever. Um, until you hear that a lot, you keep going back and testing hypotheses. And finally, when you've got a lot of traction and people are saying, wow, I, I would pay a fortune to have that tomorrow. When you hear that kind of feedback, then you can say, aha, I think I'm on to something. And I have to say, Mike Harrison took my Lean Launchpad class in the very early days. He was a great student, <laughs> very attentive. So congrats. this is exactly what he did as part of a team in Lean Launchpad. Um, so what you're looking for is product market fit. And that is, does your product idea fit the market? Any part of the market, what is that market niche? And, and by the way, you don't have to build the prototype to be able to do this. You can do this as a concept, just as a bunch of words. Okay? So you're looking, this is not easy. And there are people who worked on it for months and years until they get it right. But if you don't have it, you don't have a business. Product market fit, key concept. Uh, this is a quote from my friend, Carl Handelsman, who's now at Roche Ventures. And he says, you need relentless curiosity about the market, not the technology. And, and Carl himself is a technologist with various degrees from Harvard. Um, he, he, he understands that it's about the market. So one of the key things in building a high, high uh, potential scalable venture, which is what we focus on at UCSF, is the market opportunity. So this doesn't relate to, you know, you want to do a lifestyle business, you're just, um, in fact, I have a, a student in my current class who has a, a diagnostic service and he's doing it by himself. Um, he's got revenue, decent revenue. He's the intermediary between um, diagnostic labs and, and users. And he's pretty happy at the moment with what he's been able to accomplish. That, that model is something different, it's okay, but it's not gonna have a lot of impact and we're looking for impact in the world. So the market has to be big. It has to be 500 million to a billion dollars, $1 billion. In fact, when I present this slide sometimes to investors, they say, no, not 500 million, it's a billion. We, we want a billion dollar market uh, because that's gonna allow a new entrant to take some piece of it and be able to build. And then you need to understand the market dynamics. How crowded is the market? Are there a lot of competitors? What's your competitive advantage? And then is that an advantage that will sustain throughout um, the years? So sustainable competitive advantage is important. And you have to figure out the market size. And you know there are a lot of market research reports around that you can buy that's not the way to figure out the market. Um, they all cite huge markets. The market in 2025 is gonna be $30 billion for whatever. It has no credibility. So really the more important numbers are the ones that you build up from the bottom, which is through customer discovery. So you can look at those top down numbers and see if you can get beyond these gigantic numbers that have no meaning. But the ones that investors really value is the numbers that you create through your interviews that say this percent of potential customers says they would absolutely buy this solution I've got if it were available. That is a credible number and you can project that out to customers like them. Okay, team, also super important. So why do you think the team's important? Well, 
you can get started and have a great plan. You go out and you raise some money and you start executing and bingo, something goes wrong. There's, as always, something always goes wrong. It just never goes according to plan. That's part of being an entrepreneur. So you need to have a team there with you that can make a difference, that can sit down and problem solve with you so that um, you're not alone trying to figure out what to do. And the team, because there are several people on it, and you've chosen them carefully, should be able to come up with a solution to get around the bump that you've just hit in the road. And investors know this. They know that their things are never easy and they're looking to a really great team that with good team dynamics, not just backgrounds, but also good dynamics among them to take that company forward. So team is super important. Sometimes it's the number one criterion for investment. And then there are payers. So who is gonna pay for your product? Um, sometimes people think it's the doctor. Well, I'll give you a clue about that on the next slide. But these are the insurers and the hospital, and they're the ones that have to make the buying decision. And it is not easy to get either category to adopt something new. Uh, there's a long process you have to go through, and there are many hurdles, many committees, uh, many criteria. But if you don't get them to pay, then you don't have a product. So you really want to talk to them before you build your prototype, build your product, describe the concept, and see if it's something that they might pay for, if it meets certain criteria of theirs. These are the people who don't pay. They're the ones that are easily accessible to us at UCSF and other hospitals. Doctors never pay. I've never met a doctor who says, oh, well, that's so cool. Uh, let me give you, you know, a few thousand dollars and let me try it out. Um, that just doesn't happen. And I'm sure there are clinicians laughing here. Hanmin, are you <laughs> laughing? Um, and, and then the patient, the, you know, the patient just doesn't pay. So just keep in mind the payers are the hospitals and the insurance companies. Will they be influenced by doctors? Maybe, you know, that's certainly, you certainly wanna get the doctors on your side. You don't wanna have a hostile bunch of doctors who say, this thing is gonna cut into my revenue stream and I would never use it because then I won't see those patients. You're, that's not helpful, um, but they are not gonna be the payers. Did you see my laughing emoji, Stephanie? <laughs> Were you laughing? <laughs> <laughs> you weren't ready. <laughs> See that? <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Hanman. I had a feeling you were <laughs> there. <laughs> tech, tech savvy. <laughs> and by the way, I'm happy to take questions as we go along. So maybe I'll just pause here for a minute and see if there's some questions. Anyone want to not be shy about this? I have a question. So. <laughs> In, in the very brief experience I've had with trying to get access to reimbursement rates and all that stuff, which I feel like payers guard with their life um, for certain surgical procedures and things like that, is there any tips on how to kind of get your foot in the door to talk to some of those payers to figure out what they're reimbursing for certain procedures and stuff like that so that you can do that market calculation? Oh, wow, that's really hard. <laughs> You know, it's hard enough to get into a pair to talk about a, a potential new product um, and to get their opinion about it. So I, I wouldn't know where to send you, but maybe there's someone else in the group who has an idea. Anyone else think they have a good pair connection? Um, yeah, sorry, it's, it's not something that's easy. I wonder if you were to try, I don't know if, if there are, if there are any averages available through some sort of a um, reimbursement group, like a, what I'm thinking of is, a, as an analogy, Autumn, which is the tech transfer organization. Um, they've given out average uh, licensing royalties and so on, but on in aggregate um, by the university. And you can't get that from any university. They just won't tell you. I'm wondering if there's analogy in, in this field. Yeah, I mean, we've found, I've definitely found some like academic 
articles that have been published looking doing like financial analyses on overall cost for certain surgical procedures and things like that. But I mean, especially as this relates to pricing of new products and stuff like that and figuring that stuff out, it's definitely been an interesting challenge to try to get exact reimbursement rates and prices from payers for a lot of stuff. I'm sure. I mean, you know, you can barely get the price of a procedure that you're going to undergo in a hospital. Right? Yeah, that's true. Pricing and you're paying, right? Um, you know, pricing information just seems really difficult. Uh, there are probably people looking at this and I just, I don't quite know where to send you. So, um, but don't give up. I mean, there's probably, you know, there are people working on price transparency, startups working on that. So maybe, maybe somebody has that data out there. Hi, Lauren, this is Chris. I was gonna jump in on that. I think that's an excellent idea. There is some crowdsourced people will upload the cost of MRIs and certain procedures. But if you already have specific codes, um, there are some databases where you can look at the um, Medicare reimbursement rates for those codes. And then there's some general rules of thumb on scaling that for private pay, because private pay always pays a certain percentage more within a narrow, pretty well-defined range. Um, the other thing I wouldn't forget about is you're part of this august and important uh, research institute that provides clinical care. And so there are people there that know what they're billing. So if you go and sort of swim upstream through the accounting finance office management side of things, you'll probably be able to find out in that specialty who to talk to and somebody can give you some numbers on roughly what they're getting reimbursed at UCSF. Awesome. Uh, which yeah, is a great place to start. And then you can figure out ways to, to average those numbers or adjust those numbers for quality of living. Because uh, I, I know the reimbursement rates change by region and by state based on cost of living adjustments because you just don't have to pay the same per, per square foot of an OR in Alabama as you do here in Silicon Valley. And same goes for your nursing and your other uh, professional healthcare staff. So there are adjustments made based on where you are. But uh, you can actually find quite a bit out just by looking through the UCSF side. I, I used to do it long ago at Stanford through friends that I knew at Stanford. So it's available. I'll do that for sure. That's like great. Thank you, Chris. To, oh, I'm sorry. I'd like to add on to that, that uh, last year CMS passed a rule that all hospitals have to put their charge masters online and make them accessible. So you can just go and if you type in like billing transparency and like the name of a hospital, you should be able to find an Excel sheet with the uh, charge description master on there. And I mean, it's like MSRP, so it, you know, it's somewhat meaningless, but it's at least a number. Cool. Great. Lots of good ideas. Thank you, group. Yeah, it's always good to put things out in, in the group. Um, any other, anyone have an easy question for me? <laughs> <laughs> something I know something about? <laughs> I think you made a point on the um, funding part of uh, startup and then Typically, to get funded, I think you have to pitch about 100 to get one to two to invest. So it's about 2% success rate. So you have to be extremely um, you know, diligent and persevere and also refine your story as you learn. And specifically, what you mentioned, the market, um, packing your number with solid data is very important. Then your story is very compelling. And so, you know, I've started four companies and every time I change my pitch, every single time. So until somebody, you know, bites and then all of a sudden everybody wants in. So that means that your story is compelling and is resonating among the investors. It's a selling um, project, but it has to be backed by solid data. Uh, good observations. I, I totally agree. You can't practice a pitch too much and you have to evolve it as you get feedback from people and pe what people don't understand or um, what questions they have and you go and you build that into your pitch and you go out and do it again. And I know people who pitched 180 times before they got money. So you're not off. I mean, you are a little, <laughs> you're, you're maybe a good case at 100. Also, we like to point out on the reimbursement is, is so critical because even if you find the number and the proper code, not necessarily, you think it applies, but if you don't have the knowledge how to read the proper code, you might be using the wrong code all along. And 
they'll get you in trouble. And my preference is to use and go to people that are, are consultants, a little pricey, so do a little bit of your homework ahead of time. But definitely, you need to talk to someone that knows the business of reinvestment. It's not easy to navigate through. Yeah, that's really good advice. We just had somebody present in my global class, a uh, reimbursement consultant. And, you know, my takeaway, even though I've heard her talk before, my takeaway is I would never try to do this on my own without the help from someone like that, because it's so easy to get off the right path and that costs time and money. So whatever money you paid a consultant is well worth it. Yeah, yeah I'm in agreement. It, these things are tricky. Um, and there's a, a lot of um, knowledge base behind them, how do you with the, with the agency and codes and everything else. Yeah. Any other comments? Or I'll keep moving on. All right, why don't I keep going? So we talked a little bit about this. We we're just touching on this. What do investors require besides the science? It's sort of a given. You have to have interesting science or technology. Otherwise, you wouldn't be talking to them. But this is what they want to see. And we've just talked about these concepts. They want to see a team that they think can steer this ship forward, even when it goes off course. And they want to know that there's a big market. There's a lot of market opportunity so that there's room to um, make a good play for revenue and profit. And they want product market fit. So more and more investors are requiring interviews. Um, as we've been talking about these customer discovery interviews to validate there's product market fit. It's not enough to go in and anymore and say, I've got this amazing idea and everyone's going to love it. And, you know, I need a million dollars to do the next phase. That, that doesn't fly. Um, so where do you find capital if you're a, a startup? Uh, there are many early stage sources. There None of them are really easy, except maybe friends and family, um, which has its own risks. They're a, one, a great source that we actually do very well at, at at UCSF is SBIR grants, Small Business Innovation Research Grants. That's US government grants that cost you nothing. They give you money, they don't take equity. And um, it's a great way to get a company started. And many of our spin-offs have started that way. They're very competitive. I think the current number is maybe 15% get funded. I sit on um, a grant uh, review board for the NIH. And, um, you know, I, some of them are really great. Some of them are not so great, but it's competitive. So that's something to look at. Friends and family, you know, is where you might want to get started. You have to make sure you explain to everybody that they could absolutely lose every dime they've given you and hope that that's okay with them. Um, because if it is that you don't want to be sitting there at Thanksgiving across the table from them saying, gee, I'm so sorry, Uncle Fred. Um, it just didn't turn out the way we thought. There's um, something called seed funding, which is um, beyond what a friends and family might put in. It's a, sort of like the, the term, it's a little bit of money to get things started. People typically like to see that you've moved the technology science along to some proof of concept with that seed funding. And then you would be positioned to go after angel funding. And angels are high net worth individuals um, who invest for their own reasons, either because they're passionate about the thing you're working on because they're clinicians who have been successful and want to see better healthcare because there's a family member with a disease that you're working on and, and so on. Everyone's got personal reasons. Um, they are a good source of money. Family offices are ultra wealthy people create a, a, a structure called the family office and I think to be categorized as a family office, you need more than $100 million in, in net assets. Um, they invest, they're extremely hard to find. They all have very specific criteria. You know, some family member has dementia, so therefore they want to look at anything that to do with Alzheimer's and dementia. Or, um, and it's usually, usually motivated by a family member, but not always. Sometimes they just say, look, we've got this pool of 
funds, we want to invest broadly in healthcare and look at all kinds of new technology. There are foundations that have funding for startups. Um, for instance, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation invested $75 million in Vertex Pharmaceuticals uh, CF project. They've gotten that back many times over. It's become a major, maybe the moneymaker for Vertex. Um, and there are a few other foundations that are maybe many. I know another one of our entrepreneurs just got funding from the Epilepsy Foundation. She's working on epilepsy. And, and of course, their motivation is they are disease foundations and they are trying to help their patient populations. And then lastly, there's venture capital. And that's not so much early stage. So VCs are very risk averse these days uh, for the most part. And they want to see you get to certain milestones before they want to go in. Um, one exception is that there are some VCs who are doing company creation, meaning they're assembly companies themselves. They go and they shop around a UCSF and find some interesting science. They say, okay, uh, we're going to take the science and build a company around it. They go recruit the, um, uh, the executives to do it. They are quite knowledgeable in whatever the field is. They bring in top consultants and they build the company out. So those are sources of capital. I bet there are some questions about that. So I'll pause for a minute. Anyone want to talk about money or ask anything? All right, we'll come back. We'll, we'll pause um, later and do all Q&A. So what should you do before you spin out of the university? There are translational funds like Catalyst and Catalyst exists because the university wants the science to be matured a bit more before it goes outside. So it is, it translates science, basic science into something that can fit in the commercial world. And that's a really important function. The university provides assistance with intellectual property. So um, as a UCSF faculty member, postdoc, PhD student, you need to go to the Office of Technology Management and tell them what you're working on. Because when you walked in the door, <clears throat> you handed over all your IP that you might ever develop while you're at the university to the UC Regents. So you might as well just pop by that office early and find out whether the office feels you have something interesting that they're willing to support. If they are, that's good news because that means they'll file IP on your behalf and try to be helpful in other ways. Before you spin out, you might want to work to a proof of concept. So different mindset, it's not what interesting experiment can I do to take me further down this path. It's what do I need to prove to the outside world that this thing I'm working on actually works. And that's a proof of concept. There are many, you can do proof of concept in mice. You can do it in vitro, not as powerful. Um, certainly you could do it in higher, higher level animals, but you probably don't have money to do that while you're inside. So try to get to proof of concept in mice. Um, or if you're building a device, something that's a prototype that works. There are mentorship and entrepreneur in residence programs at the university, and those are great assets to take advantage of. It involves industry people, whether they're serial entrepreneurs or um, executives or investors or experts in a field. They exist through all these various programs that we have here and, and many universities have. There are classes you can attend, events you can attend, all learning. You can build your network because once you're outside, the network is everything. And inside it's important as well, but, but certainly that's the way the business world works. And then you could plan your scientific advisory board, something you could establish early on what experts would you like to attract to your idea and therefore your company and have initial conversations with them and get feedback. So things you'd like to do before you leave. So when should you spin out? Well, if you need to move faster and uh, again, the, the leisurely rate of research in the university is really great for people who have scientific inquiring minds, but it is not the way it works if you wanna build a company. So you get out because you know you need to 
to move things faster. You need to use external resources that can get things done in months instead of years. When you've got funding identified and you've got investors who say, look, when you're, when you're ready to spin out, I'm gonna put X dollars into this. That's a great way to spin out. You have to have a business plan. You should have a team that's ready or at least a, a co-founder for starters and then be ready to hire a team. And then you need to find out if tech transfer is willing to license or option the IP to your new company. In some cases, if they feel you, you don't have a good business plan and your funding is really sketchy and it's just you by yourself, they may say, you know, we can't do that because our responsibility to the, the UC regents is to get the highest and best use for this technology. So things to consider. And you need to know if you have an entrepreneurial personality because entrepreneurship is not for everyone. For some people, and I'll, I'll speak about some of my students who came straight out of a PhD or postdoc program at UCSF, they've gone into start, they've been attracted to doing a startup for whatever reason, they started a company and they said, I would never do anything else. I, I'm never going back to a lab. I don't wanna work for a big company. I am an entrepreneur. I love it. It's been hard, but it, this is what I'm meant to do. Not everyone's like that. There are some people who should just go find a nice job in a Genentech or a Gilead and be able to do their science and not have to worry about all these other things that are involved in starting a company. Um, so look at within yourself and see if you're able to uh, be an entrepreneur. This is a list of, of some of the attributes that are important. Um, startup life is a roller coaster. It is never smooth. If you need predictability, uh, lack of ambiguity, this is the wrong place. Um, you can start out in the morning. I've had entrepreneurs tell me, you know, in the morning I woke up, everything was looking good, and then I got a call at 1 p.m. and our last experiment just failed and we're running out of money and oh my God, I don't know what I'm going to do. That's entrepreneurial life. It's not smooth. It's not a place to go for predictability. It's not a nine to five job. You're always thinking about it. If you're not sitting in front of your computer, you're thinking about it. What, what can I do differently? What should I do? How do I deal with this issue? This whatever. So just be aware. And lastly, I just want to share with you that I am currently in the midst of teaching this class, Entrepreneurship for Life Science and Healthcare Startups, a master class from Silicon Valley. Uh, I have 110 students from 10 different countries, mainly US, all over the US. Um, I've got wonderful guest lecturers who are covering all the major topics of how one would start a company. And I will be doing this again in the spring um, so I invite everybody on this call who might be interested to get in touch with me. And that's it. I'm ready for Q&A. Someone asked me a question. Stephanie, you mentioned, as far as Matt Dietz, mentioned kind of the SBIR and that idea of soft money. I mean, is it able to, are you able to kind of pursue the soft money along with that either VC funding or what's considered hard money at the same time? Or are they, is it a stepwise process? When you say soft money, you're talking about government money, is that? Yeah, yeah, grant money. Thing? I've never heard it called soft, but <laughs> it's <laughs> pretty hard to get. Yeah. Um, so, so the way it works, I mean, you could pursue both until you get an SBIR, um, an announcement, hey, you got it and then you're gonna to have to pick. So you, you can't be venture funded at the same time as you're using government money. Um, but since you don't know if you're gonna get it, if I were sitting waiting to hear about my SBIR grant application and it's like maybe nine months till you hear, I'd be out you know, pounding the pavement talking to let's say angels at your early stage um, and other sources I, from that list I put up there, probably not venture and um, see if I could close on it. And you know, then I could decide, do I wanna, if I've got an investor who's ready to roll, then that's my decision. If I want to um, get diluted out, in other words, give up equity to the investor, 
or whether I want to wait to see if I get that SBIR grant. That answer? Sure. Okay. Who else? I have a question. Charles. Yeah, that's Charles. Yeah. Thanks. Um, when you think about all the, and you, you mentioned some of their names, like the visionaries or the innovators in entrepreneurship, and specifically, as on your last slide, the one, the slide we're looking at says entrepreneurship for life science and healthcare. Is there a particular book, you know, one of these books you see in the, the business section of a good bookstore, is there a particular book that you recommend that sort of like is his or her view is it sort of mimics your view and that would be like the blueprint or the guide that you recommend people following? Wow, that's a cool question, Charles. I, I must confess, I don't read every entrepreneurship book that comes out because they're, you know, that blue ocean, red ocean thing and so on. I mean, it was cute and so on, but it was, you know, the concepts are not really that different. Um, so I don't know, I guess I'll throw that to the group. Is there any book that you think is kind of outstanding that, um, you know? Well, there is that famous, uh, that Steve, is it Steve Blank? Because I know you you were involved in i in the early days and, and Lean Launchpad. Or, are there any of those uh, treat, uh, books that are especially good? Sure. All right. I'm going to walk over to my bookshelf and bring one back to you. Okay. Um, I'm going to walk over to my bookshelf. Okay. So this is the Steve Blank book that I was talking about. Uh, What's it called? Sorry, I can't, um, is it backwards? I can't well, do I, I, have, I have a gallery view, but I can switch. Oh, over. okay. Um, anyway, There's it's called, name. it's Steve Blank's um, book. So for those of you who don't know who Steve Blank is, he um, he really started Lean Launchpad and i was built around his concepts. Um, and you know what, what he says, it's not rocket science, but it's really changed the way we do entrepreneurship um, in much of the country. And so it's, in a way, it's genius. He just took these very simple concepts of market research, which I've been doing for decades, and made them into a thing which has caught the imagination of government policymakers and um, entrepreneurs and universities and so on. So thank you for suggesting that. That's a great book, uh, Startup Owner's Manual by Steve Blank and Bob Dorf. Uh, that's one. Um, yeah, that's, I, I mean, I, as, as you know, Charles, I'm a huge believer in this methodology. Uh -huh. I, I can, when I built this class, I d did exactly what Steve Blank would have told me to do. I did it like a lean launch pad. I did my customer discovery interviews, and then I made a prototype, which was a brochure that actually had this cover. Uh -huh. And I put that out there and I got, um, and then I took signups. And when a lot of people signed up, it was like, oh my God, I think there's something here. So, yeah. Oh, yeah so you're saying this master class is a product of applied entrepreneurship. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> it's kind, kind of fun that I can actually, that I actually practice what I preach. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's kind of rare. <laughs> So thank you for that. I'll, I'll um, if I come up with something, That's maybe okay. I should write that book. Maybe, That's you know, okay. I need to have a book. <laughs> yeah. I had two suggestions. This is Chris Jones. Um, Hi, Chris. Uh, Lean Startup is a good one. I always wondered how this could apply to medical devices since it takes so long to get something in a user's hands to evaluate. But there are parts that about challenging assumptions and understanding the difference between an assumption and a proven fact and making sure you're not building your, your economic or your value proposition on, on a bunch of assumptions. You need to you know, dig in and, and prove those out as soon as possible through all sorts of communication with your stakeholders. So that's one I like. But if you're gonna talk also about you know, startups and spin outs and deal terms, uh, there's a pretty good one that I've actually recommend a lot of people. I've never read the thing cover to cover because I just go to the chapter that applies to my situation where you're trying to figure out equity splits between founders and what are these deal terms for this first seed startup? Tell me about convertible, convertible notes versus safes um, and, and things along those lines. And so there's one book, uh, I think I can put the Amazon link, Venture Deals, you know, 
I gotta find it. I'll read the title. Not, not the founder's dilemma, which is no. It's venture deals. Be smarter than your lawyer. And yeah, right. Yeah, I, a lot of people like that book. It's so, a good source. I just um, I just put that out there. It'll get you up the curve on terms and structures, and you try to go through the motivations. Why does a partner want this for voter rights? Why do they want this for percent ownership? Why do they want this term versus that term? Why would the founders want something different? Uh, I could go on and on, but it really gives you good court awareness as to what's motivating everybody's movement and discussion points. Got it. Yeah. Hey, thanks a lot, Chris. So I just had two comments about the first thing you said, which is, first of all, the biodesign program at Stanford, which is now global, is great for medical devices. Um, it's very, while it's not strictly customer discovery, the way they started is they go into the hospital and trail physicians around for a few months and come back and un really understand what their needs are, what their issues are. And then they put together a list of things that they wanna work on, exactly the right way to do it. So there's a book um, called Biodesign, uh, which is the primer for medical devices. It's really great. But the other thing I wanted to say to you is you don't need to build it, you can check the, the, con the concept, just the way, I look at look at my brochure. My brochure was completely fake when I put it out there. There was no course, it was just an idea, but I put down all the elements of what a course would be like, and then people could respond to that. So yeah, I think I just saved you a million dollars. Thanks for the comments. And a tag on to what you said, Stephanie, you talked earlier in your presentation about proof of concept. Uh, something we have to do a lot in medical device or hardware in general is you can make a proof of concept. There's two ways of doing one. You can do a looks like and a works like model. So you can do a concept model that you can pass around and ask people to use and see how it might work in their workflow. And it doesn't actually work, but it's it's the right shape and size and length and it gets them thinking a little bit of how they might incorporate it. So you can get some quality feedback. And then you can have some sort of ugly thing in a box that actually shows the mechanism working and or shows how it's going to actually, when you're done with the engineering, you're going to be able to get it down a five millimeter trocar and into a very small space in the body because it can take years to do all the engineering and development work to, to miniaturize something uh, and get it where it needs to go in the body. So there is a way to, to test things with, you know, looks like as well as works like mock-ups and breadboards and proof of concept. Yeah, great. And it's a continuum. So you start with the con pure concept, and then you build a little of it, and then you test that and so on. And that's how you develop the product. So it's, it's a good process. Yeah. Other questions or comments? How about Shugo? You want to make some comments if you're still around? She goes there in a black box. I know you're there. I'll ask another one if there's dead silence here. Okay, um, good. So SBIRs are always interesting for startups that aren't affiliated with the university. You don't have sort of that lab affiliation and you know, I know it, you get points and it's a lot easier to get an SBIR grant if you've already gotten SBIR grants. So I, it's always interesting to walk the line between, hey, I'm just a startup that has a clinical advisor that I might want to turn into a PI so I can get um, some sort of NIH or SBIR money. But if you're not in the UC sphere, how do people best interface then with UC folks to help leverage that relationship into SBIR and NIH money. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Does that question make sense? Yeah, I, I think so. So there's something called an STTR, which I know less about, but that that I think it's a third of the money has to go to a university. Um, and someone can fact check me on this, I'm not sure, but it's some reasonable percentage and that might be a way that you engage um, somebody from a UCSF and tied them in. Another way, you could put them on an advisory board. Um, and, and then for therefore, you've got the connection that's obvious to them, or you could um, pay them to do some research is another, is another way to do it. So, you know, having, having the high quality um, scientists around you is always a good thing and adds to the credibility of the proposal. 
It's still I'm here. I'm trying to. I'm getting called from my other phone call, but um, other other Zoom call. But I thought this was very good. And uh, can you talk a little bit about the the course that you're offering? So you may have captured this, but in your recruitment, did you make an effort to go international directly? And how does this compare with some of the other courses that are available online? Clearly, you have found a niche. I did, Shivo, and, and uh, it was all an experiment. Yes, I intentionally went international. Um, you know, I would like more international. I've got 15% now, and I would like to increase that the next time. Um, there, you know, because we're in life science healthcare, there's not a lot of spend an hour and just listen to the recorded um, the recorded lecture. So it seems like I've hit something, um, you know, just by luck or by using the customer discovery process. Um, it, it seems like it's a good fit and we'll see. We have a lot of UCSF faculty in the course, which if you recall my other course, Startup 101, we didn't, we had a very small number and it's because I believe the time commitment is much more doable for faculty in, in this course. Um, but I've also got a very diverse group of people from, I have Scottish Innovation who's doing tech transfer for the NHS. And um, I just spoke today, I, it was the wonderful morning. I spoke to um, a man from, uh, who's in Moscow, who's got a team that's doing computational biology. Um, and then I spoke to an Israeli woman who's doing um, basically uh, executive for hire stuff in Israel. And then I spoke to, uh, there was a third country there. Um, anyway, I, I don't recall, but, uh, oh, I know, uh, a man who's in our class, but is in India right now taking care of his father. Um, so it's, you know, it's international. And I think there's a lot to be gained from all those different perspectives. Now, can you, um, like, do you give them something at the end? Do they get a little certificate? Do they get a degree? What do they get? They get nothing. They get a, gee, I'm glad you like this class. <laughs> Tell your friends. Um, you know, I don't want to have to take attendance um, to, I mean, I can't give out a, an, an anything if people never show up. Like, what would be the point? So I thought about it because people like that. But then I'd have to start taking attendance as a whole layer of administration I didn't want to take on. Cool, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't know, you weren't here in the very beginning, but I've got uh, three of my students on, on this Zoom right yeah, now. Yeah, no, I know, I, I heard and they talked, absolutely. Yeah, and, so. Uh, you know, we are very excited from Strategical Innovations to participate, so that's great. Yeah, well, thank you for your support on that. It's uh, really nice to have them. And Vinith, Vinith, why don't you tell them about the study group that you're heading up? Vinith, are you still there? I, I can't see everybody for some reason so at one time. Um, but if, if Vinith isn't there, I, I've just created study groups and um, to, to explore questions that people might want to pursue, like there's a group on customer discovery, there's a group on how to put a funding plan together, and there's a third group, I'm um, forgetting all my thirds, um, on, oh, spinning out of the university. And um, we, they just, we just set them up this week, and uh, Vinith is heading the funding group. Um, and, you know, we'll see what comes out of it. It's just so people can get to know each other and have a topic that they're interested in exploring. Um, and we also have been doing forums, uh, peer forums of various sorts. So again, uh, I put my mentors into the forums and they get a chance to chat with, you know, there's vice president of innovation in San Francisco, in the, uh, the West Coast or um, a serial entrepreneur or an investor in the forums and they can interact. So it, it's got a lot of elements to try to pull people together if that's what they want. And then some people say, look, I, I just don't have time. I 
watch these things on the weekend. I'd love to come to class, but it's never going to work with my calendar. And that's okay. If they get something out of it, that's all that matters. Yeah, but thanks for, thanks for those questions. And I'm always open to feedback. Anyone else? Comments, questions, observations? Anyone want to start a company? Now that you see what's involved? <laughs> I hope I haven't turned everyone off about it. It's, you know, it's um, for the right person and the right situation, it's a wonderful thing to do. It's a way to have real impact potentially and to make a difference in the world. And of course, I, I've had many clinicians in my classes um, in, and certainly right now I've got clinicians and they've, some of them have said to me, look, I can treat patients all day long, um, but I'm gonna see you know, 20 patients in a day. If I create a company and can bring this technology out to the world, I can impact millions of people. That's what I wanna do. And so some of them choose to do that. All right, well, I'll leave it to um, uh, Shiva and Hanmin and Mike, if you want to keep this going, I'm happy to stick around. Um, we would love to keep it going, Stephanie. I thought that was wonderful. And it, and it, plays, it plays perfectly into our ongoing business that we do every Tuesday at 4 o'clock. These are all the people who uh, are thinking about starting a company. So it's great. Great, good. Well, I'm, I'm glad it's helpful. And, you know, I'm available. There's my email. Um, you know, just get in touch. And if you have questions you want to run by me, or I'm always happy to help, you know, especially UCSF people. <laughs> Can I sneak in a pitch for your calendar? Can you, uh, we would love to have you uh, <clears throat> join us uh, as a judge for our Shark Tank for pediatric device development on March 26th, it's our next innovation symposium. It's gonna be, be quite a wonderful affair. I'd be delighted to, Mike. Thank you. If um, somebody in your crowd could send me a, a little sure. note, I'll stick it on my 2021 calendar. Okay, great. At which Thank point you. I'm hoping I'll have had a vaccine and can go out and about again. <laughs> okay, <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you tell me how to get one quickly. I'm, I'm ready to take that Pfizer vaccine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, everybody. Uh, Usha, anything else, or should we sign off? Maybe she's not on still. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, are there any more questions for Stephanie? Otherwise, we probably should. We're a little over time. I want to thank my students for coming tonight. Great. Take care. Thank you. Thank you all. You're welcome. Bye-bye.